This is The Civil Fleet, the podcast focused on the activist-led refugee rescue and support missions across Fortress Europe, with me, Ben Coles. So last month I went to Trapani in Sicily, Italy, to cover the final few days of the pre-trial against the Aventa refugee rescuers. This episode is going to be focused on those final few days of the pre-trial and we're going to hear from a bunch of different people. It's going to be a bit different than most episodes that we've done on the civil fleet. So before we get into it, um, I'll just give you some background into the Aventa if you don't know anything about them. So the Aventa was a refugee rescue ship that saved around 14,000 people in the central Mediterranean between 2016 and 2017. Initially, when they started, they were welcomed by the Italian Coast Guards and the other Coast Guards that are operating in the central Mediterranean. But something began to change. The Italian secret services, including the anti-terror and anti-mafia squads, began spying on the Aventus crew in September 2016. And this was based on allegations from a security guard who was aboard another NGO ship. This security guard had links to Italy's far-right politician, Matteo Salvini, who at the time was the interior minister and is now, unfortunately, Italy's deputy prime minister. He has since retracted some of his statements and I think he's been discredited too. I'll have some notes to more about him. Anyway, the Italian services seized the Juventa in August 2017 and initially warned 10 members of the crew that they were under investigation. But it took until March 2021 until charges of aiding and abetting illegal immigration to Italy brought against four of them. They swore are Catherine Smith, Daria Spigri, and Sasha Gurki and Uli Troda. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced those names. Uh, we've actually had interviews with Catherine, Darius and Sasha before on the civil fleet and you can look at the show notes for those if you like. Anyway, the preliminary hearing against them began in May 2022 and the process has been marred by the prosecution committing various procedural errors and a lack of proper translation for the German defendants. On the first day of the preliminary trial, which was on February 28th, the prosecutors asked the judge to drop the charges against them. Now, that, this, I did not expect that at all. I had, to be honest, I didn't know what to expect, but I did not expect the prosecution to give up on the first day of the final um, days of the preliminary trial. So, here was an interview I did with Darius and Sasha on that evening, February 28th, about the prosecution dropping the charges. Well, let's, should we get started? Should we do this thing? So mm. Sasha and Darius, thank you so much for giving me your time today. And I've been really busy. Everyone wants to talk to you, so thanks so much for talking to me. Thank you for coming here and yeah. supporting us since years. Yeah, I've been, I think I've been covering this, your case since 2019, I think was the first time I wrote about you. Mm-hmm. And actually, since I started the podcast in 2021, never done an episode in person oh, every great. episode has been online so it's really good to be able to touch you yeah sorry so <laughs> so yeah this is good to do my first interview in uh, person with you both um so i mean there's so much that's been said about your case i don't quite know where to start so i think let's start from yesterday how did you feel yesterday or this morning? Did you manage to sleep through the thunderstorm? Yesterday, all oh, my trouble seems so far away. <laughs> um, but um, I didn't sleep very well. To be honest, I slept only one and a half hour because I was really excited and I watched uh, old punk rock song records on YouTube <laughs> and thought about how bad the world is. Not to me, but in general. Um, yeah, I was super excited what will the day bring today because, of course, it's something like a leading, a direction leading what the prosecution will say. We thought all the time that it's excess, it's really important what the prosecution will say. And so, yeah, I was super excited. Yeah, me too, but uh, there was a lot of stuff to do, so we worked until, I don't know, half past 12 in the night. And then I fell to sleep. So I slept well, but uh, 
uh, short. Short. Say. And then in the morning he woke up very, very early to send out the press release and to make everything ready and receive the first calls and stuff. So it was busy. So, well, I'm okay. That's good. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I was really nervous yesterday. I kept thinking, what am I, what's going to happen? Who am I going to talk to? What? And like, you know, I was pretty nervous. I'm surprised that you two were quite calm. <laughs> and so this morning, I saw you both in the coffee shop this morning near the courthouse. You went in and then can you tell us what happened inside? Because it was pretty crazy. It was unexpected, I think. In the coffee house? Not the coffee, in the courthouse. <laughs> Yeah, it was a, a surprising start because we, we got the um, yeah the idea what the prosecution will say. So roughly that uh, they will ask for the termination for dropping the charges, and then I mean, we it was one of the possibilities, but uh, of course we, we, we were not um, thinking of this because uh, we don't consider the, the the prosecution as a friend. Not in any way, so we also not expect something good. So we we hope for for his changing in mind, but uh, it was not expected, let's say. And even if we even if we thought that maybe he is changing a little bit his mind because he finally read the files a little bit more <laughs> intensive, I didn't expect that it's going so hard in that direction. It's not like it's not like a little bit in a different direction. He changed. It was like he changed his opinion completely. Yeah, yeah. he was not so talkative uh, over the, the hearings anyway, so he said barely anything. Sometimes he was also just leaving the, the courtroom while we were talking or while lawyers were talking, so we didn't have the feeling that he is so engaged and had more the feeling he would like to bring the case to the main trial and then start with the merits and everything. So. But then he uh, surprised us, um, and I think it's yeah, it, it was a multi-phase situation because there was I was happy, it was a relief of course because that it's not a decision but it's it's setting the direction and it makes it uh, easy and open for the judge to decide in, in our favor. Uh, but then there is also there's the feeling of anger mm. because. What the fuck? I mean, why they took so long? And then during the speech of the prosecution, there were several moments where I really, I really wanted to freak out. And it is this kind of yeah. Um, uh, when I because there was the moment when he pressed charges, so there was this super long investigation phase, mm -hmm. and then he he decided to press charges. The same guy. In, the in same the guy. And he said today that on the day he he decided this. For him, there were enough um, objective uh, elements for a crime. Mm -hmm. So, and, and until, and he also was not changing this. He said, they're still there for him, but uh, he has he doubts over our intent. Mm -hmm. And this is for him the point to not ask for the main tribe. So and also, he so doesn't see that there were proofs or evidences that we did something against the law. For me, it was contradictory. I think we have to we have to see and have to uh, read the, the the decision from him or the uh, his player again, because it was contradictory. And uh, but still, there were so many elements to to be angry with him. Say, you, you, why you need two years of uh, preliminary hearings um, to look into the files, to listen to your main witnesses? To ask the, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center for the important information, and mainly it was what we had said from mm -hmm. the beginning that they coordinated our uh, our actions, and uh, so and and you, you didn't listen to our lawyers when they asked in 2019 already for the uh, termination mm -hmm. of the investigation, and in this questioning from 2019, all the elements are there, so we didn't brought new elements but we had a lot of time to bring them again and from this angle and from this angle but in the end everything was there so it, it was really this kind of guy why why you didn't make your job before do you think they did that deliberately do you think that they always knew that they were gonna you know have have no case it always sounded to me like there was nothing against you guys 
Uh, but do you think they always knew that and this was the plan to kind of keep you out the sea or to deter you from rescuing? It's a little bit difficult to say because, of course, they will not say it if it was like that. And it's, I don't like this conspiracy theories and to, <laughs> to speculate so much. But we know now, at this time, we know that uh, this all, whole, the, the, all, the whole investigation started because of three witnesses and we know now that even the police where they did their first um, was I also interviews where they did where they did their first interviews um, even the police didn't believe them really you know, they wiretapped their phones and they they had really clear in mind that they are not reliable no. and that was the beginning of the investigation that even the police didn't trust the witnesses and the prosecution could have known that if you read the files um, in a good way and that is that's a shame of course and, and of course that leads me to the thinking they had a plan and they just wanted to maybe even it's not about us but to show the Italian public people and the European public people to show them there was something strange with the sea rescue and to have an argument to go more and more against them because to, to see it um, doubts, doubts are against us in the public opinion. And uh, we should not forget that they, that they managed to seize a functional rescue asset. And, mm. and not only this. I think that, that that's uh, horrible enough. Because the consequences, we know all that the consequences are people dying at sea. But more than this, they, they launched this criminal, so the, the criminalization campaign and all the, these administrative but also criminal legal efforts got a push. They got a justification because there was this case from us um, with a lot of um, yeah, justification in itself, you know, because they said, okay, we have ex-police, we have police officers who testified against them. We had an undercover police uh, officer who testified against them. We have um, audio recordings, we have uh, footages. So all this was, you know, perceived as a kind of a quite stable case. So there is something to, and, and this pushed a lot and gave a lot of um, justification for other criminalization. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I mean, after the seizure of the event, a lot of uh, rescue NGOs stopped, mm -hmm. or at least risked for a bit, for some weeks, for some months, some uh, never came back, but luckily a lot of them came back and even popped up with bigger ships and more assets, uh, despite the criminalization effort. But it was more harder. The donations went down, the lawyers had a lot of stuff to do, the, all the communication teams, they had a lot of stuff to do to counter this, uh, this negative impact from our case. Mm. And also my opinion is that they, whoever they is to be honest, but that someone <laughs> likes it, that the people talks about um, if we collaborated with smugglers or not instead of talking about what happens on the central matter and instead of talking which laws forces the people into the hands of smugglers and how shitty the whole situation is and how responsible Europe is for what happens there. Nobody talks about that because everybody talked about, hey, did this NGO guys work together with smugglers? Who is, why is it a topic? I still cannot understand it why it's a topic if somebody works together with a smuggler when it's about to save somebody's life and to get somebody out of a death camp it should be normal that whole Europe is on their legs and go out there and get these people out of these camps mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. I think you've, in your press releases you've said and I think you probably said this yourselves as well that um, you know since the event has been um, detained, mm -hmm. is that the right word? Yes. Yes. Seized, seized, seized is a better word. Since the, uh, the event has been seized, like around 10,000 people have died in the sea or something mm -hmm. like that? Like, it's only in the, cent in the route in the central Met. Mm -hmm. So you're taking the, uh, the, the Aegean Sea uh, or the, um, the, the Moroccan route, then they're even more. It's even bigger, right, yeah. And that's... And, and, but, and that's also, we should not forget, it's not only about the people who are dying. I mean, that's horrible enough, but um, more than 20,000 people were, uh, 200,000 people, sorry, were 
in this period of time uh, kidnapped and brought back uh, to Libya from the so-called Libyan Coast Guard. And this is the most effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and also there, just the highest court in Italy says it's illegal to bring people back to Libya when, mm -hmm. because it's not a place of safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the end, I, I don't like old tellings, but history will tell us right. Mm. I think you're on the right side of history. History will absolve you, I think. Um, so, um, so that was in court today. You're going to be in court tomorrow for the next One few days. Thing for me, what because at the end for me that was really an important sentence when the prosecutor said, literally, he said he wanted to highlight that it's not illegal to enter Italy via this way. He said. They don't, the people don't sneak in in the forest and they try to sneak in over a secret green border or something like this. He said clearly, these people come and they don't avoid controls and they want to apply, also he said it's not irregular, this way of entry, or this way of entering Italy. And this is one of the most important points in this whole discussion, that everybody says, hey, it's illegal migrants. And no, even the prosecutor said today, it's not illegal. For me, that is a big thing that he said. So. Yeah, that's really important, actually, because that, that, you know, the whole case against you then is completely it's meaningless, right? Yeah, when it's not really good, then... Yeah, 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 so yeah, what, yeah. what have you actually done? Like, what law have you broken here? Yeah. Um, that makes me more angry than relief, to be honest, because it's so obvious. And we all, all and not only us said it all the time, it's every NGO and every human rights activist and so many other people said the church, blah, blah, blah. So many people say, say this since years. So that at the end, it's a shame. I'm happy that he said it, but it's a shame. Yeah, yeah. So today was just the first day of the last four days of the pre-trial of the preliminary hearings. Tomorrow, you got, it's your defense, it's the defense's turn, right? It's your turn to give statements, right? Is that, is that correct? Not us as defendants, but our lawyer team will make the final conclusions so there will be yeah, different elements they, they would like to highlight uh, going a bit into the merits of the, the case but also making this uh, broader legal interpretation uh, and I think they will tackle all the points of uh, this nonsense of uh, the illegal entry um, the colluding with the smugglers so they will attack all these what the prosecution called the objective elements of the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we heard another lawyer and she pointed also, rightfully, she pointed out, we don't have to go into the subjective objects. So we don't have to discuss if Darush or me want to, wanted to collaborate with smugglers. Because there, is, there are no objective elements of the crime, so we don't have to talk about the subjective elements, you know? It's, it's like if there is no crime, we don't have to talk about if someone wants to commit a crime. So, and I think that's, um, that's the, main, the main goal for tomorrow, and to bring our political arguments back to the discussion, because I'm happy that the prosecutor was having, making this decision today. Even if I'm doubtful about his uh, reasoning, um, but uh, tomorrow we will talk about the political and the, the social reality, you know, in a political way about the realities of the people who are dying at sea. Mm -hmm. So and that's super important. For us. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah, bringing back is the point. Uh, bringing back the reality. And so Saturday, the judge was supposed to give, like, you know, decide whether it's to go to trial or whether to. Uh, drop the charges. Is that still the case? I mean, today he said uh, he will um, most likely not decide on Saturday because he need or he will take some time to yeah to lay out his arguments because that's also uh, I mean it's his responsibility to argue that rightfully and I think he he also um, he. Um, he see it coming that our lawyers and also the other lawyers who are coming in the next days that they will have a different point of view of the prosecutor. So not everyone is on the same page and there are some important uh, legal points we have to discuss and uh, then the judge have to decide. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, 
so he will might he might take a bit longer than than Saturday. But it must be like a good step in the right direction that the prosecution wants to drop the charges, right? That's a big step in the right direction. You'd hope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sure. so, it's always a little bit difficult because when something went wrong for two years or at the end seven or eight years, something went totally wrong and then it's stopping wending wrong. It's just, it stopped wending wrong, but it's not good. Also it's a difficult to explain for me, but uh, I always use this metaphor of somebody punched you since weeks, some, or you meet somebody and he punched you a lot, and then he stops punching you and goes away. Did you feel that you win? Because <laughs> we didn't, uh, then we, of course, we fought, we fought a lot, we, we did a lot, and we brought a lot of arguments there, we talked there, and we did a lot of um, awareness work and things like this, but at the end still, yeah, when somebody stops to punish you for something you never did, it doesn't feel like a win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's that's totally right. I think, and that's we have to bring the judge and the, not only the judge as a person, but let's say the the broader sense of the court, and then also the public to the that they acknowledge that uh, it's not that they're not letting us go because of less um, or weak uh, evidence they have to say we, we really want to try that they have to say that is acquittal because there was no crime because sea rescue cannot be a crime that, that's still our goal and we, we really want to reach this yeah and not like we convince them by the truth but we they accept that they never said the truth mm-hmm. yeah yeah, I think that's and important. That, that, they, that they say they did a mistake, or mm-hmm. at the end, of course, mainly we hope that they say the whole system is wrong, what happens in Europe, but uh, that is maybe a little bit big. <laughs> <laughs> no, but as a, as a winning point for today, I, I totally see um, that we forced the prosecution to look into their case. It, it sounds strange that this is a winning point, but I think that it's a fucking winning point for us because they were really forced to listen to their main witnesses, to look into the files, and then they recognized, shit, we cannot hold up this. It's, it's, just, it's just a pile of crap. What we have pile of crap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> so, um, I, d- I don't have any more questions about the case, but I've got some questions about some other stuff. Just two couple of quick questions. <laughs> What's that? Some questions about algebra or history? Not algebra or history. I can ask you about punk rock, actually. Oh, it's, um, it's a good music. <laughs> it is good music. I like it, and too. It feels good to be one. <laughs> I'm in a punk rock band at home, actually. It's very oh, good, yeah. Nice. We're, we're not very good. No one likes us, but I like it. So... Um, the ship. We talked about the ship. It's kind of rotting, right? It's been in a mess. You put you. Uh, I don't know what's going on with your legal challenge over that, but will you get it back? Can you use it again? It's a question for the captain. Um, <laughs> so the fact is that it rotted really strongly in the harbor of Trapani, and they realized, the court realized that that is not a good way to handle a seizured um, object. And they realized that they have to give it, if they have to give it back to us, they have to give it back to us in a good shape. And that's why they took it already, uh, they took her already out of the water and they cleaned it a little bit, they threw away the rubbish and at the end they accepted, they have to give it back in that shape as it was when they seized it. Um, Of course that will take some time but I'm hopefully that we will get it back sea worthy and rescue worthy and that it can operate soonly again. Is it in Trapani still? I went down to the docks today to see if I could find it but I I couldn't see it. It's in the shipyard. Ah okay. And um, I don't know if you can talk if you want to talk about this on record but you were telling me about the flags. Do you want to tell me about do you want to say that on the microphone or not or shall I uh, can delete this bit. So I thought it was quite funny. At the end, we have also here some flags because in the nautical world there is an alphabet, there's a 
alphabet of flags, so, F, so for every letter there is one flag, so that you can hoist messages on your mast. And we did that on the Juventa, and it's four flags, and it's an A, and C, and A, and an B. And if the good willing listener doesn't know what it is, they can Google it. Four cats are beautiful. Abolish camps and borders. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and but the main funny thing, of course, for the for the people who know the real meaning of those four letters, we had this flag, those four flags, also on the Juventa when we sailed out, um, of mainly from then on when I was a captain. <laughs> and they were still on the Juventa when they seized it, and so the cops on one. There was a moment when the cops drove away with our ship, with the flags and the wind, and it was quite uh, curious. <laughs> uh, not yeah. curious, curious. Uh, no, that's, yeah. Curious. It's yes. yes. sad and funny in the same moment. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, since you told me that, I'll tell you something that I have not told many people in the UK. Yeah, from ACAB tattoo? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, um, when I got my new, I've got, a, I'm in the, the journalist union in the UK, and you have to have a special number yeah. to give to the police. If you, you know, if they want to question who you are, mm-hmm. and can you guess what my number is? Yeah. One, three, yeah. one, two. Nice. Anyway, <laughs> so... Funny moments when you show it. Yes. Well, I've never been asked for it, but if they do get asked for it, I was trying to think of an excuse. Maybe Why is it show it without being asked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Printed on a shirt. <laughs> right. Anyway, this is my last question for you both, and then you can get back to your day. Um... When are you both going back to sea? When are you going back to rescue people and do this stuff? Are you going to go back? Do you plan to go back? Yeah, for yes. sure. I, at the end, we, all of the, not all, but three of us from the four Juventa defendants went out all the time, even while the trial was ongoing. And for sure, we will continue because people continue to die there and that has to be stopped. And that is the reason why we went, went to where we became active now. and as long as Europe kills people we will resist what he said exactly <laughs> <laughs> well thank you both so much um, it's so good to meet you I'm really pleased to meet you both it's been nice I've, you know, I've been talking to you emailing you and messaging you both a lot so it's great to actually see you um, and I think we'll end this interview here I might shove this microphone in your face again in the next few days uh, but I don't think we need to do another sit down talk like this Maybe sometimes it. also some shots in the face, <laughs> <laughs> not on the microphone. <laughs> right, guys. Okay. Thanks very much. That was great. Thank Thanks you. for listening. Thanks yes. for asking. Cheers. Ciao. Solidarity and resistance. Okay. That was the interview with Darius and Sasha. Thanks again to them for speaking to me. I hope the noises in the background weren't too bad for you. Um, next, we're going to speak to Elisa Di Pieri who is a regional researcher at Amnesty International. I spoke to her because I wanted to know why Amnesty International has been following this case, why they have been promoting um, the event as human rights defenders. Um, She's going to tell us about that, um, about the implications not just for the event of foreign human rights defenders, but also for people on the move. And um, yeah, she's also going to tell us about the EU Ombudsman's ruling on Frontex, which is also quite interesting to hear about too. Okay, here's the interview with Elisa. I just wanted to start, Elisa, could you tell us what is your role with Amnesty International? I am a regional researcher in the Europe Regional Office of Amnesty, based in London. And uh, so your, your role is to basically look at human rights issues in, across Europe, is that right? Uh, yes, particularly in uh, Italy, Malta, uh, Spain and Portugal. OK. And I'm guessing by your accent that you're from Italy originally, is that right? I am indeed, yes. OK. So, um, as you know, the trial against the event, uh, the, the pre-trial hearings, uh, this is the last week as we're recording, um, and yesterday, the um, prosecution recommended dropping the charges. Um, and I know that you, Amnesty International has been supporting um, the Juventa crew members for a long time. I just wondered if you could tell us why, why have you been supporting them and why is, it important, why is this an important case for Amnesty International? 
Um, yes, we have been uh, um, supporting them from the very beginning, from the um, seizure of the Juventa in at the beginning of August 2017. And uh, that happened uh, whilst we were uh, working on uh, um, the, the rescues or lack of rescues in the Mediterranean. Um, so we were focusing on what was happening to the refugees and migrants coming over from uh, Libya. And uh, we were concerned because uh, um, things were changing um, at that point from uh, a moment of uh, um, in which uh, states uh, were really making an effort to rescue people uh, and take them to safety to um, uh, a, a hardening of uh, rules uh, um, and an attempt uh, at uh, uh, stopping the, the number of people arriving. And what happened with the Juventa, um, you know, at the same time, uh, there was an attempt by the government of Italy of the time to impose a code of conduct uh, on rescue NGOs. So there were a number of things happening that we were following very closely, which, which were creating an environment of uh, obstacles uh, to human rights defenders to uh, tr trying to protect uh, and assist uh, asylum seekers and, uh, and migrants. Yes, and I think it's been about, I think a year ago, Italy introduced um, a new legislation on, on refugee rescues, right? And now they have to return to ports and they seem to be getting sent to reports really far away from the rescue zone and this kind of thing. So yeah, it is a major issue, isn't it, about what's happening in, in Italy? Yes, um, this was the uh, one of the most recent pieces of uh, um, obstruction to the work of uh, human rights defenders and rescue NGOs. Um, now um, the, the measures tend to be more administrative um, and all about the security of navigation, supposed security of navigation. So there's, there's a number of bureaucratic obstacles and new rules that, that uh, um, are imposed to NGOs which in our opinion are sometimes not uh, uh, consistent with the obligations to rescue people at sea and in fact uh, are dangerous and could uh, uh, put people in harm's way because uh, uh, rescues can be delayed. Um, the disembarkation which is a, an integral part of a rescue at sea is definitely delayed because uh, uh, rescue NGOs are requested to disembark much more far away than they could and also um, because uh, um, the, um, the the authorities are, are, are just uh, putting bureaucratic uh, requirements onto the work of NGOs which are not not necessary in the um, and that end up uh, undermining uh, the effectiveness of the rescue at sea system. Do you think that the um, you know the, the what's happened to the um, Juventa crew, um, you know that, that has? Do you think that's had a chilling effect on human rights defenders, or do you think it could have? Um, I think uh, that uh, moment uh, when uh, the investigation started uh, was definitely a moment where uh, states were pulling out all uh, um, stops and trying to really uh, block uh, NGOs. So. What happened to the Juventus was uh, raised alarm, uh, there was the code of conduct, uh, and then there were investigations opened into many other, uh, into the operations of many other NGOs, uh, um, Open Arms, uh, MSF, Sea uh, Watch, uh, several times over. Um, so it was, uh, yes, it was uh, one of the uh, elements that created uh, um, a, a a, a very difficult environment, definitely a hostile environment for uh, human rights defenders, which is uh, um, in violation of the obligations of state to support them and uh, ensure that they operate free from the uh, fear of reprisals. Uh, that's that's a, a, an international law standard. Um, but um, with uh, rescue NGOs, because they are so resilient uh, and committed to what they do, I don't want to say that it stopped them. Uh, um, the, the smaller ones, and certainly Juventa, had to stop because they seized the ship. Others, 
who, which was bigger, managed to go on, and um, and I, I and I would say that uh, these people are very very uh, committed uh, to to rescuing and helping. So um, I wouldn't want to say that they managed to scare them. In fact, the way in which uh, Juventa also has faced uh, this. Um, these court proceedings has been uh, uh, really a, a lesson in courage, uh, in, in my view. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, having speak to them this week and met them for the first time, it, you know, it's clear that they're never going to give up. And uh, this is something they believe in, and, and it's the right thing to do, I think, as well. So, um, Elisa, could you also... this? The, I think the case against the event uh, has obviously had issues for human rights defenders but can you tell us about the sort of wider human rights issues that it's caused it's not just for human rights defenders right it's also going to affect has affected i think migrants and refugees and people on the move right uh yes so um uh the environment overall is very negative at the moment uh, um but i i want to start from yesterday because yesterday was uh a good day for uh, Juventa and the other human rights defenders in this trial. Um, but it was a good day also in Brussels for us because uh, um, the European Union Ombudsman uh, released uh, its uh, um, findings on uh, uh, its investigation into the um, search and rescue operations of Frontex and into why Frontex is not. Uh, uh, as effective as it could uh, in uh, saving lives. And we are very pleased about those findings because uh, uh, the EU Ombudsman, which is this um, agency that uh, um, ensures that the EU institutions operate according to the law and good administration practices, it has clearly said that, that uh, the rules of Frontex need to change, that there needs to be an inquiry into deaths at sea, um, and that the Frontex needs uh, to use uh, um, more often uh, the powers it has to interrupt uh, its operations uh, uh, and its support to countries um, which do not uphold the search and rescue obligations. Uh, and uh, you know one of the thing one of the cases in which the um, ombudsman looked into was uh, the, the tragic shipwreck of um, Pylos in Greece where Frontex could have been a lot more effective. And we can also think about Cutro in Italy, uh, whose anniversary has come up recently. So um, there, are, there is a measure of accountability that is happening very slowly. And with the um, trials against NGOs, um, we can see that the courts eventually tend to vindicate uh, the stance that they are just upholding uh, the law of the sea and try to rescue lives. Uh, but the overall environment against uh, refugees and migrants uh, is there and the EU pact uh, um, that has re recently been approved is just, uh, you know, the last uh, um, uh, a really negative move of the European Union and European states uh, to, to stop people outside the borders of the EU. Yeah, it's really concerning, isn't it, I think, um, about like, uh, everything that's happening in, in Europe in regards to uh, treating the human rights of everyone, not just European citizens. Um, what, does, what do you think Amnesty wants to see the result of the... Uh, of the event case, I mean, this is a really obvious question, I think. But um, could you tell us, like, you know, what's the result you would like to see in this case? Well, um, I mean, this has been uh, uh, such an outrageous investigation that should never, ever have begun. Um, the the prosecutors have had so many opportunities to stop it, uh, um, and uh, I I am glad that they finally reckoned with how. Um, poor the investigation they were relying on was. Um, and I hope that the court uh, will not insist on uh, opening this trial now that the prosecutor has backed down. Um, I would like to see them being uh, uh, completely um, uh, acquitted in the sense that uh, they really did not do anything that uh, amounted to a crime. Um, but uh, I think 
our um, we at the at the core of this trial and the reason why this trial is so important for us is that uh, they were accused of smuggling of a criminal organization that was smuggling mi uh, migrants in and uh, it's the misuse of the uh, offense of uh, um, facilitation of irregular migration uh, that is at the core of this trial. And so ideally what we would like to see is a, a, a decriminalization of irregular entry for migrants and refugees and uh, in Italy uh, where it is still an offense and also a review of the uh, facilitation of irregular entry um, offense. Uh, so that uh, human rights defenders are not uh, um, are not uh, um, uh, able to be um, regarded as smugglers, and uh, there are openings at the EU. They come with risks as well. Um, attempts at uh, reviewing uh, the uh, facilitators' package, uh, so called, uh, which contains the the. Um, the, the um, the harmonization that the EU attempts to do of this offense, which is present in, in the various states. Um, we need to be careful that uh, um, humanitarian clauses that are used to uh, reform this legislation are not uh, only the ones applicable to um, Red Cross type of work uh, of mere assistance, but also that, the, that they apply to human rights defenders who denounce abuses, uh, um, and uh, and so this is this is really the the big prize that the whole system uh, is uh, changed so that it doesn't uh, block uh, human rights defenders from carrying out their work. Okay, that was Elisa from Amnesty International. Next up, we're going to speak with Alison West, a senior legal advisor at the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights, the ECCHR. So Alison is going to tell us why the ECCHR has been observing this case, why it was so important to do so, and about the worrying trend of European governments criminalising solidarity with people on the move. So yeah, Alison West from ECCHR, um, we're in Trapani, or Trapani, and uh, following Juventus. I know you've been a legal observer. Before we talk about the case and uh, you know what you think, what you think about it, and the organisation's take on it, why don't you tell us what the ECCHR is briefly? Yeah, so ECCHR, the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights, um, is a Berlin-based NGO that uh, uses legal means broadly conceived to enforce human rights worldwide, which we do together with survivors, affected communities, and partners all over the world. And you're based in Berlin, but you work everywhere, right? Like you just said. We're based in Berlin, but yes, we work with uh, communities and partners all over. And um, what was my next question going to be? My next question was going to be, oh, so we've had previously on the civil fleet, we've had uh, some people on the East, from the ECCHR talking to us. So I'll put some links in the show notes to that so people can find out more about the organisation. So why did the ECCHR get involved in this Juventus case? Yeah, we've been following the Juventus case since 2017, so since the Italian authorities seized the ship. Um, for us, the accusations and the legal proceedings against the Juventus crew were incredibly worrying. We see them as uh, part of a broader trend across Europe um, to criminalize not just sea rescue, but solidarity with people on the move more broadly. Um, so already in 2019, we um, submitted a, um, a letter to the UN Special, Tour, Special Rapporteur um, for Human Rights Defenders. Uh, with our concerns about the case and she actually then intervened in 2020 and more recently again in 2023. That um, was Mary Lawler, right? That's Mary Lawler uh, with concerns about the case and, and from our perspective we see um, sea rescue as a form of vital human rights defense uh, that needs to be actually protected and promoted by states, definitely not criminalized. 
Um, the sea rescuers are actually fulfilling um, the role and duty that international law uh, puts on any vessel at sea. Um, and also actually sea rescue is uh, first and foremost the duty of, of states. So the, the civil fleet, the Uventa crew and the other civil society organizations um, that are active in the Mediterranean now, they're there in response to the void left by states who have not been fulfilling um, their duties. Uh, so for us, it's been super important to follow the case, um, also to make sure um, there was so much um, actually in the public domain about this case already during the investigation phase. I mean, there were a lot of irregularities in terms of surveillance, uh, wiretapping. There were leaks in the media where the names of the Uventa crew and other defendants were already re um, released into the public domain, leading to smear campaigns um, and threats against people. So. Um, even though the preliminary hearing phase in criminal cases are usually not open to the public, um, we at ECCHR, partnering with some other legal and human rights organizations, uh, requested special permission to actually be in the court because we thought this can't happen behind closed doors. Um, there's too much already. It's so politicized already. I think it's very important that we had a, a third party perspective so that uh, there could be information about what's happening in the courts. Uh, that people could access that wasn't the um, prosecutor or the state's perspective and also wasn't the defense perspective. That could be kind of a third party perspective. Uh, yeah, so that's what we've been doing now for 34 hearings. Uh, we write these reports in English. They're available on the ECCHR website um, and also mirrored. Uh, there's a section on the Juventa Cruz website that, that copies the, the reports there as well. Yeah, I've seen them and it's, yeah, well, I'll link to those as well so people can have a read. Um, so what have your, like, this co this case, from what I've been following, it's been pretty crazy. Um, there's been lots of irregularities and, and these kind of things. Um, what have your observations of the, of the case been? Do you think it's been fair? Is that a fair question to ask? So I think there have been some um, concerning elements of the case from, from different perspectives. There are the accusations against the sea rescuers themselves, so the allegation that they were coordinating with smugglers or the crime uh, that they are actually accused of, which is facilitating a regular entry of migrants to Italy. Um, there's a huge question as to whether sea rescue can actually be characterized as facilitation of a regular entry, and the Juventa defense lawyers have made very strong arguments against this. Um, and so I think there's, from a, a legal perspective, um, definitely uh, a defense that needs to be mounted against uh, the equation of sea rescue, which is definitely, again, as I said before, an obligation, a duty, definitely not a crime. Um, there's that concern, but then there are also fair trial concerns that have come up in the course of the proceedings themselves, especially things like access to adequate interpretation and translation, um, because these are people in Italian courts who are not Italian speakers, and this is something that people on the move face. So the Juventa crew are facing um, challenges with respect to this too. They haven't had the entirety of their case file translated into um, their uh, their native languages, and they also have had a lot of recurring troubles with having um, adequate, qualified interpreters, uh, both in the courtroom itself and also in the um, interrogations that they have the right to uh, ask for as well. Um, so that's concerning for them, but they also have great lawyers, one of whom actually speaks German for the Uventa crew members. But this is something that migrants and refugees people on the move face in Italian courtrooms every day and they don't necessarily have access to the same resources. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important that this is a key issue from this case that we keep um, uh, keep shining a light on uh, because these, uh, these are fundamental rights in order to, to mount a defense <laughs> against this type of accusation um, is incredibly important. I think the, the event had a campaign, I don't know if it's still running, but it was like no translation. No translation, no justice. Yeah. Uh, I spoke a little bit about that I, before I came to Trapani. I went back through all my episodes about the event and listened to them all. And I remember in that one of the episodes with Francesca, one of the Juventus lawyers, who will hopefully interview as well, uh, she was talking about that. And you know, it's important to say. I think it's quite important to say like that they speak a European language and they're in Europe. So getting a translator isn't a huge, shouldn't be a huge deal, right? But if you speak Arabic or Pakistani or Farsi or something that it's much harder to seek justice. And I think that if, if the Juventa crew had not had such, you know, attention on them, then I don't know what could have happened if they hadn't had such great lawyers and all the people that have 
help them, then maybe they could have this could have gone a completely well, we don't know what's gonna happen yet, but yeah, this could have been so different, right? It could have been incredibly different. And I think it's really important to also shine a light on the fact that there are currently over a thousand people in Italian prisons on the same charges of facilitating irregular entry um, into Italy, but these are actually people who came on boats themselves, so people on the move who are being accused of this same crime, but for having driven um, the boats. And these are these are people that the authorities, you know, pick out a person um, because they they feel that they need to identify a driver. So these people are actually detained um, and then also don't have access to adequate uh, translation and interpretation when they face these charges in court. So I think that's a, a really uh, important piece that needs to needs to be a focus um, of the fair trial concerns around the case too. The crime itself, but also um, access to adequate rights in order to defend oneself uh, against the charges. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, there's been, and there's a, there was a case just a few weeks ago in the UK of a guy whose name I can't remember, drove a boat, well he was accused of driving a boat and, and then he was also charged with manslaughter as well. Uh, it's just like, in those cases are just so horrible because the guy driving the boat maybe had less money than the other people. I mean, we don't know the details of that specific case, but yeah, charging people for human smuggling because they drove a boat is really fucking harsh. <laughs> and in most cases, they don't have a choice in this. They're simply put on the boat and put out to sea and then and someone has to, has to do it. So, yeah. Um. Well, um, was there anything else you wanted to add about the case, Alison? Anything else you wanted to say about it in general or? You don't have to say anything if you don't have anything else to say. <laughs> in general, I think a really important aspect of this is that this is part of a broader trend of shrinking, uh, shrinking space for civil society action more broadly. So it's not just um, in the case of civil sea rescue, but you also see the criminalization of solidarity of people at land borders, at all of the Euro European external borders. Um, and I think it's important that we connect these struggles and that this uh, crime itself, the sort of weaponization of law, um, uh, is something that needs to be yeah, combated in, in all of these instances. Absolutely. Well, Alison West, thank you very much. Thank you. Great stuff there from Alison. Hopefully the background noise in that interview there wasn't too bad. So next up, we're going to speak with Leah Reisner. Leah is a former member of the Juventa, and she talks to us about the criminalization of her friends and how criminalization of sea rescuers has had knock-on effects of other groups. She's also going to tell us why she's running for a seat at the European Parliament with the German left-wing political group called Die Linke, political party, not group. Anyway, here we go. Here's an interview with Leah. Enjoy. Okay, red means it's recording. We're recording. Hi, Leah, yeah. Reisner or Reisner? Reisner. Reisner. Yeah. Thank you for coming back on the Civil Fleet podcast. Oh Thank no, you. we interviewed before we had the Civil Fleet podcast. It was a written interview I did with you before. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It was about the first mission of the Louise Michel. Yes. Yeah. So you are, you've got many hats actually. You've got the, you were a member of the Louise Michel, you are a member of the Juventa, and you also um, a member or a candidate for the Dailinka party in Germany. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll come back to all those things in a minute. How have you, you know, you were a former member of the Juventa. How has all of this been for you? Mm. Yeah, um, so the Juventa was basically, or actually my start into sea rescue. Um, I went on a mission there in 2017, which is actually the mission which is um, very much into discussion in court now. So one of the days I've been on was the 18th of June, which is one of the days where we have been accused of coll collaborating with smugglers. And um, I only plan to do one mission. So I wanted to go for two weeks and then I was supposed to go back and work as a nurse in a hospital in Germany. And I ended up doing five, six years of sea rescue then after my first mission on the Juventa. And I think I did a second one right after my first one. And the next mission was the one where the ship got seized. So I was just back home, um, I think a week or so, when I got the news that they took the ship away. And I was still very much into all the emotions you have when you went go out there for the first time. And it was this time where sea rescue really was crazy. So it was crazy. 
this this um, one operation in June, I think we have we have supported more than four thousand people in two four thousand. So it was <laughs> incredible. Um, never experienced something like that before. Like for sure, <laughs> most certainly, like no one does probably. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then I very quickly got involved in all the anti-repression work um, because I connected with the people who were running the Juventa with Sasha and Dario a lot. Sasha has been, uh, Dario has been my very first captain, so we had very emotional moments. Um, yeah, and ever since I'm kind of around in one way or another, yeah. Did you ever worry that the charges were going to be, anything was going to be brought against you because of you know, what's happened to the others? Um, no, not really. I think, um, I mean, I, I've been a nurse back then. Um, I became a, a head of mission later in my kind of career in sea rescue, but back then I was a nurse and I feel like as a medic, you always have this kind of protection. You still are considered a humanitarian worker. And also all the other people who have been investigated, most of them have either, either been on the RIP team or captain or head of mission. So I didn't felt really threatened by that. Um, also, honestly, I didn't really care. Um, it was really more like the political, um, the political situation for me was always in the foreground. Like, the more important thing. It was for sure I was worried. I'm still worried about my friends and my comrades and the people who go out there and do sea rescue because this criminalization does things to people, right? Like mm. this is how repression works. Um, but in the end I feel the political the political situation is just way worse mm. than the threats against an individual. Right, and, I, and like we've said a few times, like in this, the few interviews I've done over the last few days, yeah. we keep making the point that the European, the you know, the, the situation that they're facing is it, the situation that they're facing is shit. But like, it's much worse if you were a person on the move, right? Absolutely, hundred percent. You could probably die in the sea, or you can, you know, you might get arrested for driving a boat or whatever. Um, I want to make that point quite clear in this in this episode, which I think I have to. Um, I hope so. Anyway, um, so. Were you here the other day when the, the charges were dropped? Did you come afterwards? Uh, no, the charges weren't dropped. The, the prosecution yeah, recommended that they. Recommended yeah. Uh, yeah, I got the news when I was flying into Trapani or like Palermo. We had a layover in Rome, and when I switched on my phone again, um, I got the message that that happened, and. This was like very, very mixed emotions. Like, uh, very, like very first emotion certainly was relief and also being happy for my friends because Dario, Sasha, Katrin, Uli, those are friends of mine. Those are people who are really close to me who I have seen struggling during the past years with what happened to them. So I'm incredibly relieved for them. On the other side, there is this huge anger for seven wasted years, so much wasted money. Um, and also the consequences, I mean, there doesn't need to be a trial now, there doesn't need to be like this main trial, because I think that the European Union, in that case the Italian government, kind of reached their goal, right? Like, the criminalization, it was just the beginning of a massive criminalization of not only sea rescue, but also people on the move, as you just said, and it had huge consequences on everyone involved in this movement. So there were so many organizations who just dropped out of sea rescue. Other organizations are really struggling now to get their ships registered, to get an insurance, to find people who are ready to face this threat of criminalization. Everything has become so much harder and so much more ineffective than it has been. So I feel that in the end their goal has been reached. Also the mood in the societies in Europe has changed. I remember when I started doing Sea Rescue, I, I did a lot of interviews um, where we really have been celebrated, like we were the European heroes, um, standing up for human rights, all these kind of stuff. It was really like that. And just the other week I was in a talk show with a German um, Christian Union politician who said straight to my face that he thinks that I'm responsible for people dying in the central Mediterranean. Fuck it hell. So, <laughs> And this is the mood also in the society changed. And I remember 
that moment when we got the news that um, Fabri uh, Leger Legeri, the former Frontex boss, said that um, there are there's proof that we are collaborating with smugglers in front of the Italian parliament. And it has been proven that these accusations were wrong. It was just a flat out lie. Mm -hmm. And even though this for sure has been like a little side note in the newspapers as well, but this, it sticks, right? You yeah. throw shit and something sticks. Surely that's libelous as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think this really worked pretty well for, for like anti-migration politicians who just, you know, throw accusations out there. And even though in the end it turns out everything's wrong, even now if um, there won't be a trial, charges will be dropped. Still, there is this this little bit of uncertainty for people which sticks. Like, are those people really just humanitarian activists, or or are they somehow are they somehow criminals? Mm. It's just sticks. And, um, I think it's part of like a wider sort of thing. Uh, sort of, it feels like a lot of states, a lot of countries, are a lot of governments. They are like quite afraid of left wing activists or people that are doing this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like. I don't know if you remember a few years ago in the United States when Trump was president, mm -hmm. they were talking about Antifa activists mm -hmm. as if they were like the IRA or yeah. some like huge yeah. terrorist organization. Yeah, um, yeah that felt, it's, quite, it's quite scary. And I, I hope if the trial isn't, doesn't go ahead, which, well, who knows if it goes ahead or not. I guess we'll find out soon. But um, I hope this is kind of the beginning of the end to that. Like, I don't think it will be, but... Um, you know, I have been on a panel, I think, in 2018 or something like that, which, call, has, which, which was called uh, Shrinking Space Solidarity, where I've been together with activists, uh, climate activists, and activists for animal liberation, and um, also self-organized refugee groups. And we were talking about how our work, our activism, is getting more and more difficult, more and more criminalized, more and more repression. We get more and more, um, more and more, more uh, just legal boundaries set by states on what we are allowed to do and what not. And I think you're right. I think it's because we had a moment in 2015, 16, 17, where we were really strong, where also societies have been on our side, not only in Germany, but a few kind of all over Europe. Mm. Um, and that changed a lot. So, um, yeah. It's pretty scary, right? It is super scary. And not only, uh, not only on like a political level and to see how much right-wing um, narratives are sticking with people, but also on a very personal level, to be honest, because, I mean, I'm getting death, death threats, I'm getting, um, I get recognized on the streets when I walk through Berlin, and this is scary, because we see, like, a friend of mine who's a, a Kurdish activist, their, his house got burned down okay, recent I uh, like okay couple, two, two or three years ago but still like you know this is, this has like real consequences mm. when politicians are telling us we are responsible for the democracy failing and right wing uh, right wing ex extremists are taking over and we are responsible for it because we are the ones standing up for human rights mm. and for a right of asylum and advocating for freedom of movement and this kind of stuff and there are people who do believe that mm. There's, a, there's like in the UK at the moment, I mean this is totally a side issue, but in the UK at the moment a government, this hard conservative government, mm -hmm. they were recently, the, the Prime Minister was recently photographed with these, the tractor protests mm -hmm. and you know I think he's trying to win them over mm -hmm. to his side. Um, these like farmers protests have been going all over Europe, which I don't really know much about, but he was there but at the same time both parties, both main parties in the UK are now trying to blame or trying to trying to cast the Palestinian solidarity people as mm. like Islamists or like yeah. people that are like, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. they don't demonize them anyway, but it's really scary, I think, an attack on, on these kind of mm. things. Yeah. It's a fundamental democratic right mm. to be able to protest, right? Mm. Mm. Hi, this is Editing Ben here. Sorry to put into the interview here of Leah, but I would just like to say a few things. The civil fleet is entirely grassroots is totally funded by me if you would like to help the civil fleet to continue to platform the amazing people that we have platformed on this podcast then you can do so by making a small donation to the civil fleet 
our costs are really small, but any donations that you can give would really, really help. So if you'd like to do that, you can go to co-fee.com slash civilfleet. That's ko-fi.com slash civilfleet. Any donations that you can make would be greatly appreciated. Also, if you can't do that, I know times are difficult, then what you can do instead is you can share us around, give your podcast, send this podcast to people that you know, people that you think would enjoy it, people you think they would hate it, even send it to them. Um, you can sh- give us a rating on podcast apps, that would really help. Uh, give us a thumbs up and a like, subscribe and uh, like, as they say on YouTube. Yeah, we're on YouTube too, so check us out on there. Um, what else can I say? I think that's it. Uh, yeah, spread the word. Anyway, it's back to Leah. So, while we're on the subject of politics, you do you want to talk about the dial Because you're, you're, ru- you, yeah. you're running to, for EU Parliament, right? Yeah. Why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the left party in Germany has been in a really difficult situation in the past years. There have been lots of internal conflicts. And some of them are solved now by some people just leaving the party now, which is a good thing because they've been very nationalist, partly racist. Um, And I feel that there's never been a moment where it has been more important to have a very strong left opposition to like global developments when it comes to right wing conservative a right-wing conservative shift in societies, right? I think you don't only see that, you don't see it only in, Ger- in Germany or in Europe, but in the everywhere, US as yeah. well, everywhere. And I think parts of it are very easy to be explained because there are so many changes happening in the world at the moment and so many conflicts going on. Climate change, the climate crisis is really threatening to a lot of people. And we kind of, as the left, and I don't only mean parties, but also movements, we kind of failed in giving answers on how this transformation can look like without scaring people off, mm-hmm. right? And um, I think also not only in Germany, but everywhere, the pandemic, the Ukraine-Russia war um, has led to lots of uncertainty when it comes to uh, social uh, security, right? So inflation is hitting. Um, People really don't know how to pay their bills anymore. Mm. In Germany, we do have a huge housing crisis. There are just not enough, um, there's just not enough space for people to live anymore. And governments have failed for years and years and years to tackle those issues. And now we kind of have the results of those failed politics in the past years. And... um, yeah, I kind of decided to just try a different route now. I've, I've done, like, um, how do you say it in English? I don't know, but I've, I've done politics on the streets for, like, basically my whole adult life. And I, start, I started as a teenager. Um, and never, I mean, I told you the last time we talked that I'm considering myself an anarchist and I still close my eyes and I'm dreaming of a society without those power relations we do have. But the reality is, at the moment, though, this is a utopia which is very far away, to be honest. Yeah. And um, I think the reality is we have to deal with things on different levels. And mm. I hope that I can kind of bridge certain gaps between movements on the streets um, left-wing movements and the parliamentary actions which are demanded by those because mm. I feel sometimes there is this gap which which needs to be closed urgently because we need to join forces. There is at the moment there is it's not the time to fight about small things but we really need to join forces because otherwise I'm, I'm scared mm. of a few a future where, for instance, the AFD in Germany is taking over. Yeah, that's I'm really scared of that. Mm. And Can I just say that if anyone doesn't know who's listening, the AFD is alternative for Deutschland, alternative exactly. for Germany. Yeah. It's a far-right party. Yeah, it's a far-right party which is dreaming of um, deporting people, but not only people like refugees and asylum seekers, but actually Germans who are not assimilated <laughs> enough um, because, yeah, they are like... Yeah, very, very strong nationalist, I would say fascists, partly at least. And they are very strong at the moment because they are giving simple answers to complex questions, right? They are giving, um, for them, no matter what the issue is, 
the people who are responsible are refugees, migrants, right? So you don't find a flat, you don't find a house. It's because we have too many refugees. Um, the, um, the school system, the education system is failing on all levels. It's the refugees. Um, <laughs> the bills are high. It's the ref everything is the refugees. And I think this is, um, it's easy answers to complex questions. It's a result of, as I said, failed politics over the past years. Um, or decade, I would say, and I feel as, especially from when you look into parties, I feel we need to get to learn to be more populistic from the left as well. Oh, I think the left can also, like, not that simple answers are the way to do it, but the left can also yeah. do that, right? Exactly, yeah, and I would say we need way more money for... Um, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in, in Germany you have um, states which are financing then smaller units, mm -hmm. I don't know how to call them. <laughs> in Germany it's Kommune, uh, and they just don't get enough money. So mm -hmm. they have to take a decision whether they build a new um, building for refugees or if they uh, go and build a new school or employ more teachers or um, put some money in public transportation. So they have to make this decision. And I think this is incredibly stupid. Mm. And I think we need also a European solution for that because there are still like lots of um, lots of places in I think all over Europe where people n want to uh, to take in refugees to, mm. to take care of people, right? Mm. They just don't know how to how to pay for it. Mm. And I feel really there needs to be a European solution that like the suggestion of my party is that we have a fund, a European fund, which is giving money to the um, cities and towns who are willing to take on, take in refugees so that they don't have to make this decision if mm. they're going to um, if they're going to take care of their schools or their public transportation or if they take care of refugees mm -hmm. because this is insane. I feel this is really insane that they have to make these decisions and mm. these are real problems. Uh, I think the word it was council maybe that we're looking for like government local councils. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah thank We've you. We've got local councils in England yeah, that go yeah. bankrupt. Like, yeah, that exactly. Are fucked. Yeah. yeah, and uh, this is the same and then um, yeah, and I feel this is really what, what, what needs to be done. And there is so much money, no? I mean, if you look into what the, what, I mean, Frontex budget last year has been 900 million euros, right? And um, we are putting so much money now into weapon system. We are talking about a European military union. This is, in these times, insane. <laughs> and then we have, um, like, these huge, um, companies who are don't who, are, who aren't paying taxes, right? I guess so much, so much going wrong there, and I feel like, yeah, I want to tackle that. And also, I feel like I don't know how it's in other countries in the European Union, but in Germany, we do have a pr problem with representation um, in politics. And I'm someone who's I'm I'm a nurse, so I didn't went to college or anything. I don't have like a higher education because in Germany you only go to school for nursing. And I'm coming from a very like, difficult background, I would say. Not, I'm not coming from money at all, so my family doesn't have anything. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, and I feel that this is also something where representation in Germany is really lacking. Mm -hmm. We are getting better now with having more people of color, more black people in politics, but like the like working class, which is not existent in the sense of Marx anymore, but you know, mm -hmm. like, there's not a lot of representation. Like most of the people in the politics these days are lawyers, uh, you know, yeah, people with from business backgrounds, from business yeah. backgrounds, all these kind of stuff. But not the people who are actually affected mm. way more mm. by the politics. I think you see that a lot. You see that really clearly in in England at mm -hmm. the moment. I think yeah. there's a real like class divide between yeah. the representatives and the actual people. Yeah. yeah. Well. For me, it's um, uh, this is something where I also I feel, you know, the the especially in Germ like the right wing, not only the AfD but also the CDU, like the Christian Democratic Party, which is the Conservative Party. Um, they are really trying to play people against each other. So they are talking to working class people and tell them, yeah, because the refugees, you don't earn more money or you have to pay so much rent or this kind of shit. 
And it's more difficult for them to say something like that to me, right? Because I can say, well, brother, I'm not I'm a nurse. You know, like mm. don't don't tell me that they are like responsible for me being in a shitty situation as you and your company bosses buddies. Mm. Like they are responsible for that. It's not not the poor guy from Afghanistan. Mm. Definitely not. And yeah, I think that's something which is missing. So I tr I, s I thought I'd just gonna try. I think yeah, I think it's a good. Uh, I also have a you know, I would say consider myself some kind of anarchist as well. Yeah. So I like to find parliamentary routes. Like we had a left wing leader in the UK of the Labour Party a few years ago, mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. and it was quite exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, um, and you know now the Labour Party has completely changed. Mm -hmm. It's so it's pretty right. It's basically the Conservative Party yeah. now, and it's I feel like there's a lack there's a lack of hope in the UK mm -hmm. now. It's either like this shit option or this slightly less shit option. Yeah. But yeah, so you are going to go. Hopefully, you're going to get into the EU Parliament, and hopefully, we can start to change things a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> let's see, let's see, yeah. I mean, we have this uh, development in Germany as well, right? Like, as the, when the AfD started, the Conservatives, the CDU, also started to kind of um, repeat their narratives. So also the Social Democrats shifted to the right, and everyone shifted to the right because they are trying to get away voters from the AfD by kind of doing their politics, which mm. is, you know, insane because there's like millions of studies that this is not working this never this has never worked mm. you can't you can't get rid of fascists by doing fascist policy no yeah that's just not <laughs> not how it works mm. because people are going to vote for the original right mm. why should they vote for the social democrats for the cdu if they can get like the and that this also means that when social democrats or cdu is um taking over slogans from the afd that means AFT is getting even more radical in their in their demands, and this is just like an endless circle. So I feel it's so important to really be solid on the left, saying, "Okay, no, we stick we stick up for human rights. We stick up for people on the move, for the people, the working class people, for you know all those." Yeah. So when is um, well? I, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. That is really good. Um, and I feel like we could talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when will you, can you say when, I don't know what, Brexit now, I have no idea when yeah, the European Parliament election. It's in June. June. Um, yeah, and I'm a little bit excited because this year is the, fir it's the first time that in Germany people can vote from 16 onwards for oh. the EU, which I'm really excited about because I will do like lots of events at schools now where I'm really looking forward to. Uh, because yeah, there's hope. There's the hope. The yeah. kids are all right, at least partly. But, <laughs> yeah, I really hope for hope hope for them. Yeah. And it's um, will it be like a Berlin? Is that the seat that you're going for? Is it? No, well, we, I don't in know Germany, how it works. in Germany, we have actually only one basically list. So if you vote for the left, you vote for me anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, I see. Yeah, because yeah. you get so many. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, people listen to this know what we made. <laughs> Let's see. I will share it for sure. <laughs> All right, Leah, that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was nice talking to you again. All right, that was great to speak with Leah and to finally get her on the podcast. Always nice to speak with her. Next up, we are talking to Beppe Caccia. He is the head of operations with Mediterranea Saving Humans. Um, we were aboard their rescue ship when we did this interview. So that's pretty cool. Um, the rescue ship, if you don't know, is called the Mare Ionio. So Beppe is going to talk to us about his views of the criminalization of the Juventa and about how the Italian authorities have treated their his organization, Mediterranean Saving Humans. Um, a couple of things to note. He will mention the Piantedosi decree, which I've probably mispronounced. Um, so the Piantedosi uh, decree was passed in Italy last year by the current interior minister, Matteo Piantedosi, who it's named after. Um, basically, the law requires non-state rescuers, aka NGO, refu res NGO rescuers, to immediately request a port after they have carry out a, carried out a rescue. Um, and this is also part of the reason why when people are rescued in the central Mediterranean, they are sent 
miles away to the north of Italy to uh, disembark the rescued there. Anyway, so we're going to mention that. uh, Beppe mentions that and we'll talk a little bit about it in the episode, uh, in the interview. And he also mentions the Maus Etienne. Um, Now, you might have heard about the Maus Etienne. I don't want to go too much into it. If you listen to, if you look at the show notes, we've got some previous interviews with people from the Mediterranean Saving Humans who talk about it in a bit more detail. But basically, in 2020, 27 people were rescued by a commercial ship in Malta's search and rescue area. But Malta refused to allow them to come aboard. It refused to give them any help whatsoever. Um, And the rescue people were trapped on this boat for like 40 days, I think. Um, Some of the rescued tried to take their own lives because obviously a massive commercial ship is not suited to look after these types of people. Um, So they were completely abandoned there. The company, you know, was at a loss of what to do. And eventually the Marionio, um, which is Mediterranean saving humans boat, they went out took the people from the Maya Sketien and brought them to land. Heroes, not according to the Italian authorities though, for some reason. Okay, that's enough talk. Let's get on with the interview with Beppe. We're still recording. Um, so it's Beppe Caccia, right? And you're head of operations for the Mari- Mediterranean Saving Same Humans. Here. Yes. Thanks for showing us around the boat. That was really, really good. Um, I always like to Happy come on to the ships. Happy to have you on board. Thanks very much. So I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. You've been here in Trapani for the trial of the Juventa. What do you make of the whole situation of that? It's a very broad question. I just wondered what, what do you make of it? The Juventa case, but more in general, the investigation uh, here in Trapani was, let's say, the mother of all attempts uh, to criminalize uh, the civil fleet uh, since uh, 2017. And the fact that currently proven that uh, there is nothing inside uh, these uh, 30,000 pages of investigation, uh, secret service, uh, undercover agents, uh, but everything they put uh, in this case, there is really nothing, uh, is uh, the last uh, confirmation uh, of uh, that this investigation uh, on uh, civil uh, rescue activities uh, see, uh, were and are uh, only uh, motivated uh, by the political attempt uh, to stop uh, solidarity at sea in the Mediterranean. And this is in, in the same time uh, something uh, important that also the Trapani court is going uh, to assess that. In the same time, it's sad to see how many efforts uh, European states uh, and Italy in particular put uh, in the last years uh, in this attempt. I, uh, I think that all these resources uh, would have been uh, better used uh, as uh, resources to improve uh, the capacity of uh, rescue at sea and welcoming uh, on, sh- on shore uh, for the people on the move crossing uh, the Mediterranean. Mm. Because they must have spent millions of so years. Let's say on the this. failure, yeah. the failure of this uh, criminalization attempt. Uh, that, be careful, uh, are not stopped. Uh, uh, ourselves, uh, we have uh, this uh, open uh, investigation uh, in the phase of preliminary hearing in Ragusa for the Maeskatien uh, and Marionio case. So, let's say criminalization is not stopping. Uh, there are still ongoing attempts. But the failure of uh, these criminalization attempts uh, uh, as uh, registered uh, till now is in the same time the failure of deadly uh, migration policies in the Mediterranean uh, by Italy and other EU member states. Mm. And uh, I think we're, we're, well, we're stood right now on the Marionio and you've got you just mentioned that you've got your own cases against the Marionio. Did you? Did, I think. Did you say earlier that the ship you can't go out to rescue at the moment? Are you being blocked from re- be going out? No, to no, 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 no. Uh, last time uh, the ship uh, just got the 20 days uh, administrative detention uh, for violation of the Piantedosi decree law in uh, last October 2023. 
that is also another crazy, <laughs> uh, crazy story because of the motivation of the detention and fine is uh, uh, the will of our captain and of our head of mission not to cooperate uh, with the so-called Libyan Coast Guard. So, paradoxically, the Italian state uh, is uh, targeting us because we refused to ask the place of safety, the port of disembarkation, to uh, the Libyan, to the so-called Libyan uh, uh, authorities. But this is uh, another phase of criminalization, no? the attempt uh, by the Italian uh, state uh, to legitimize uh, Libya or Tunisia as uh, safe uh, places, uh, as uh, possible uh, interlocutors uh, when uh, we know instead uh, that pushing back people uh, to Libya or Tunisia means uh, to expose uh, the same people uh, to any kind uh, of violence, uh, abuses, uh, tortures, uh, rapes, uh, and even, and even uh, death. Mm. But if you see, since years, uh, this is the only strategy of European states uh, in the central Mediterranean. Instead uh, to sail out again, uh, a necessary search and rescue institutional mission at sea with the Coast Guard and the navies of European states, instead of opening uh, legal and safe uh, passages uh, to evacuate uh, people from Libya and Tunisia, their only strategy is uh, still uh, uh, repeating uh, uh, this uh, disaster of uh, deportation by mm. proxy. And I think it's been roughly a year since there was the new decree by the Italian yeah. government. And we don't need to go to the specifics of that. but And we had uh, 16 cases uh, of uh, civil fleet uh, ships uh, punished uh, with temporary detention and fine using this decree. That it's clearly uh, a political move uh, to boycott, to, to try to stop uh, the civil rescue mm. activities at sea. And so the Marionio, as far as I know, you're based here in Trapani? Is that where you... I mean, we are mostly based in Sicilian ports. Uh, so it changes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But then have you, after you've rescued anyone, have you been... Dest you know, never, been never, no. never. We don't... This is still a question for us. So we don't know if uh, it happened because of the Italian flag. Uh, but even in our last mission, we had a quite incredible... Uh, uh, for one operation, Lampedusa as uh, port of safety. Yes, uh, and second time uh, Trapani. Because the other ships, like, I'll just say for the recording that, uh, like you know, the bigger ships they've been sent exactly. to like the north of Italy, which is so far away. It, compared to the UK, it's like rescuing people in Cornwall. I don't know if you know where that is, but the south of England, and then taking people all the way up to the yeah, north of Scotland. Glasgow or it's, uh, yeah, Edinburgh. It's, insane. Um, so yeah, and um, when are you next? You know, when you're next going out? Can you say when you're, the Marionio is next going? Yes, out no, our intention is to sail out before the end of March, depending also by weather condition. You know, the Italian government is happy because uh, in uh, January and February the numbers uh, of uh, arrivals uh, in Italy, autonomous uh, or rescued by the Coast Guard or by the. Uh, civil fleet uh, ship uh, were low uh, in comparison uh, with the past year 2023 but the, the reason is that uh, for the first time since two years uh, we have uh, uh, particular conditions of bad weather in the central uh, Mediterranean uh, so there were very few departures from uh, the North African shores no, anyway, we are preparing the ship uh, for uh, our next mission before the end uh, of, uh, of March. Perfect. Well, I think I've asked everything I wanted to ask, Pepe. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Anything else you want to talk about before we finish? 
No, I, I think that uh, this is important because we are in Trapani, we are uh, following closely the last uh, preliminary hearings uh, of the Juventa uh, case. Uh, I think uh, it's important to note that despite all attempt uh, of criminalization of solidarity, we have now uh, a real deployment of a civil fleet of more than 16 ships, uh, three planes, a great experience uh, of uh, hotline like uh, the Allen phone. Uh, so the capacity of European uh, civil society to be uh, active, uh, to be at sea, uh, to be, let's say, in a positive relationship with the people on the move, uh, which are the, who are the real mm. protagonist of, of, this, uh, of this story. Never forget that uh, criminalization attempts uh, are mostly oriented, targeting uh, the people of the, on the move, no? the, uh, the so-called smugglers, uh, the, the captains of uh, small boats uh, crossing uh, the Mediterranean. But despite uh, all these attempts, uh, we are still here and we are more than, uh, than before and more active than before. Great. In some ways, you know, it's really, it's great that civil society has stepped in to do this thing, but it's also like it's bad. also sad yeah. <laughs> at yeah. the same time. Sure, yeah. sure, because uh, uh, we would like uh, to be able to stop our operation uh, in the case uh, that uh, the freedom of movement uh, would be really considered as a fundamental right uh, and really implemented. Great. Well, thanks for that interview, Beppe. No, no. Thank uh, you for really great. Thank you, Ben, for your work and your great blog. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> okay. Thanks to Beppe for that brilliant interview there. Next up, and finally, we are going to hear from the Juventus lawyers, Nicola Canestrini and Francesca Cancellaro. Hopefully I've said them right. Um, they are the lawyers, like I said, and what we're going to hear is not an interview, but a debrief that um, that Nicola and Francesca gave to the activists and to the few journalists that were there um, on the last day, um, on the penultimate day, actually, of the trial. Um, so I've edited this down a bit because it was quite long. Um, but yeah, Nicola and Francesca, here they are to talk about uh, what happened in the case for the last few days. See, sí, um, I welcome the chance to make a little bit the resume of what's, what happened. It, there were some surprises, other things were expected. Um, let's, don't forget, we shouldn't forget that this was the case in which the sea criminalization started. The Uenta case was unanimously um, seen as the different case from all other cases because here they assumed to have strong evidence for proving um, the, an agreement between uh, smugglers and uh, rescuers. This toxic narrative started with this trial and it lasted for years. And what we thought um, from the start was there was a politically driven uh, intention from the investigators, because we have the evidence of that, that they wanted to find those clues between people smugglers and sea rescuers. Because we know that, how the investigation started, there was a strong political input, there was the Minister of Interior asking the Servizio Centrale Operativo, which is the special branch of the police, to take over the investigation, then they found um, stupid um, witnesses uh, that supported that request. Uh, from the first moment on, we said, and we absolutely insisted, even before had, we had full access to the case file, that there was no clue whatsoever. And it should be reminded that in all the wiretappings, I don't know, 14 phones wiretapped, the bridge of Juventa wiretapped, computer seized, email searched, pictures searched, videos analyzed, um, Whatever they tried, they failed. They failed to find any clue whatsoever uh, in those connections. So we, yesterday or two days ago, we started where they 
where they um, try to um, put the final word from this final summary from Italian police, Italian Coast Guard, uh, in which a lot of elements were missing. And what were missing during the investigation, this sounds incredible to everybody, not only to you, but even to us as lawyers, is that it is completely legitimate that somebody suspects something. But if there is no evidence, you cannot go ahead with that. And if you don't look for the evidence, you won't find any evidence. And they didn't even try to look into the, sort, the, the main source of evidence, which was um, the MRCC. It, Hi, this is Ben here, editing Ben here, cutting in. Uh, sorry to cut in there to Nicola. I just want to explain something that he's just said. He mentioned the MRCC. So an MRCC, it stands for Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre. And basically the sea is split up into various different MRCCs. So the Central Mediterranean has three MRCCs. You've got the Libyan MRCC, the Italian one and the Maltese one. And they are responsible for coordinating rescues in the central Mediterranean. So when one of the rescue ships picks someone up, picks a group of people up or finds a boat um, in the sea, they have to contact the MRCC that is responsible for that area. And the MRCC is supposed to um, tell them where to go and what to rescue, how to rescue them, who, not necessarily how to rescue them, but where to take them once they've rescued them and who else is on the scene and this kind of thing. Um, they're, they're supposed to coordinate it all, but recently they've not really been doing that. Um, or like Italy's MRCC, because of this law that we mentioned earlier in this episode, they've been sending them bloody miles away to disembark uh, the rescued. Anyway, it turns out that the prosecution in this case didn't even look at the MRCC's communications with the Eventer and how the Eventer were in touch with them the whole time. And obviously, if you're going to be smuggling people, why would you be contacting the authorities? Um, anyway, let's go back to Nicola and Francesca. So it was completely surprising and I cannot do otherwise than not give a clear political um, idea behind that omission that they did not ever, they didn't, they stated and they made the judiciary state that uh, Juventa acted completely as a um, unconnected uh, chain in the um, rescue organization without any communication with MRCC because Juventa wanted willingly to ignore the law, to ignore how the, the sea rescue was organized, not communicating with anybody except on these chat groups, allegedly with we don't know who, but the idea behind that was with Libyan uh, people or the so-called Libyan Coast Guard. Um, so uh, what we were able to prove with the MRCC uh, GPS positioning and tracking of the ships and especially with the communication, email communication and uh, phone communication with the MRCC that Juventa had its own idea which is completely legitimate. We have the right, everybody of us has the right to claim that uh, Europe and Italy should not become a fortress but this does not in any, uh, under any circumstance uh, lead to the fact that this could be a motive for a crime because the crime has to be proved with these elements and um, the clear facts were that Juventa was always or sent to the rescue um, uh, so to the, the search and uh, operation um, um, scene from MRCC or informed immediately MRCC even if the condition of the boats were good the captain always stated that very clearly to the MRCC that the boats, the, 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 the boats were good, meaning they were not sinking in that moment, of course, they were clearly in distress. By definition, they were in distress, as the Italian Coast Guard repeatedly um, stated that, uh, that uh, an overcrowded boat with no navigation system, with no experience in navigation, with no um, individual um, um, equipment for safety is a, is a boat in distress but they were not sinking at the moment and so this was on one of the elements that were brought by 
some officers uh, to the attention of the judiciary saying it's not really a rescue, but it's absolutely, the, we, we, we always engaged in real rescues and the fact that we made transshipments was clear to MRCC, was absolutely legitimate and it was even ordered by MRCC. Uh, so this days um, started in the, in the trial with this surprise, with prosecution giving up. They gave up. So that's absolutely a, a victory for who has been criminalized for years by the same prosecution. And let's say they changed their mind. And as Sandro Gamberini said, and said um, today, uh, they gave up. And so we have to take knowledge of that. But this does not mean that we will forget what they did in these years. And I hope for them they could sleep well. Because this was not without a price. Not only for you as defendants, but for civil society and for the people that died in all these years. And I really hope that they will never um, understand what they really did in criminalizing the wrong people. Because I, I didn't I, I didn't and I do not see the same engagement in criminalizing the true criminals uh, who are the people who are trying to make um, money out of the people with all the things that are happening to them when they are trying to, uh, to get a better life. Uh, so this surprise was, uh, of course, a good, a good news. And one of, this, um, of the elements that I would like to underline is that they were a little bit unlucky in finding Juventa crew on their road. Because these charges could have smashed everybody in this room except them. Because facing those charges with that amount of pressure in the public, in the public opinion, um, this huge engagement by investigators and prosecution, seizure, lot of, lot, 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 a lot of money spent, uh, everybody would have given up. But then, unlucky them, they found the Juventa crew, which was from the start. We know the crew, it was, we, it, it, were, it was 10 defendants from the start. And um, from our point of view, Francesca, we, we cannot express our gratitude strongly enough uh, for saying to the crew, and I'm not talking to one or the other person, because we had a lot of, because of course, if you, if you have many defendants, the defense needs to have somebody to talk with. If I need somebody, I need, we need to text somebody saying, I need this one, I need it tomorrow, in two days, whatsoever. And there were some issues, of course, because the technical decisions had to be um, shared with the group. There were some political issues in some decisions. And the crew were, uh, was able to, to always have a very prompt response and a very fast answer. Was it operational? Was it from the decision-making process? Um, some of them I see here now, uh, Sasha, Pia, uh, but then Hendrik, Katrin, um, Miguel, they were all, always at the right moment, in the right position, and they really helped us a lot. And helping us, they helped us to um, lead prosecution to the conclusion that they couldn't do nothing else than not ask for dropping the case, which we asked in June 2019 based on the same elements, on the same reasoning that we made in court, but without many, many elements. But we were right then, we are right now, Juventa was always right, and we will be right, mm -hmm. even if we, it, it is going to come to the May trial. Because please don't forget, there is a risk here. There is a risk, there is a huge pressure. Um, it's true that the fact that prosecution wanted to, wants to close the case clears completely some toxic arguments, but it's true as well 
that we are going to celebrate the decision to drop the case when the decision is taken, not earlier. Few words because Nicola has already spoken a lot. <laughs> no, really few, really few words. Uh, just to say thank you. I have the opportunity to thank many people that uh, are here, but uh, uh, it's always a good moment to say thank you. And everyone knows uh, why I'm saying thank you. And uh, I really think that uh, it is a, pri a privilege, a real privilege, to be here today and being with you in all these uh, paths. So now I'm speaking uh, as a lawyer, but also as a person. So really, thank you. Uh, you mean a lot for, for this trial, but not only for this trial. I think that uh, uh, everyone here knows uh, how, how it was uh, being uh, within this trial in these years. So I don't have to say so, so many words uh, on this, because it's clear for everyone. So, uh, Really, one, only one thing that I really care to say is that this is a political trial. We know that uh, it was political since the beginning. We are not scared of saying that it is a political trial because we fight against uh, these accusations within the courtroom and outside the courtroom with the, with the proper tools. And we have also to be uh, proud of this because, of course, uh, we were very technical within courtroom, always. Our arguments were really technical, and we tried to uh, also to push uh, this uh, discipline and this uh, idea that everyone has to be involved in such a kind of trials because they are against defendants, uh, like uh, the Juventa crew, but uh, they are against a, a a movement of people that act uh, in solidarity. We know this uh, as, as a, an aspect and if, uh, of this uh, chilling effect uh, process. So we know uh, how many damages uh, such a kind of uh, trial caused uh, within the courtroom and outside the courtroom. Uh, so this is something that we have uh, always to bear in mind. I have the impression that we already obtain a political victory yesterday when the uh, prosecutor's office decided uh, to uh, ask for dropping the charges against you. Of course, this is not a legal victory until the end, so we have also to consider this. We are still waiting uh, the decision of the judge because that is the key moment, that will be the key moment for us. But still, it's possible to say that from the political point of view, we, ob we obtained a lot yesterday. Okay? So it's, it's a symbolic, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a key moment from the political point of view. But still, we are waiting until the end for the decision. And uh, we don't have to be um, scared of being uh, aware of the importance of this trial. Because as I mentioned before, it was a great opportunity for trying to revert the perspective, to try to not only to defend ourselves from these accusations, but also to try to propose a different model, a different idea that could be a kind of uh, counter argument against uh, such a kind of criminalization, criminalization against uh, uh, solidarity movements, but in the end uh, against the people on the move. Because in the end, we know that the goal, the, the goal of this uh, criminalization is to hit uh, uh, people on the move, and we have also the opportunity to defend uh, the Juventa crew, trying to obtain results uh, for everyone. And this is something that uh, I repeat very often because it's something that motivates myself a lot. So I think that could be also useful to, to repeat it uh, until the, the very end because <laughs> we should keep uh, trying to fight uh, against uh, all of this and using uh, legal tools as, uh, as something that can help uh, the political tools. Of course, they are not the same. We are absolutely aware of it. We cannot obtain uh, the ch so many changes, the changes that uh, we would like to obtain. But still, it's a kind of little contribution. And uh, for this reason, I, I was very happy to be part of all of this. So thank you again.
All right. Well, that was episode 54 of the Civil Fleet podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that the background noises weren't too distracting. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, everything goes well for the Juventa crew. They're going to find out um, on the judge's decision on April the 19th. So the judge will decide whether or not their case should go to court or not. Um, hopefully, um, it will be dropped and they will be free. Because uh, obviously all that they have done is protect people's human rights and it's an incredibly noble thing to do and they should be praised for it not being in court they should not be accused of human smuggling anyway what do we talk about at the end of the episode we usually say go check out the civilfleet.com uh, you can find lots of news stories there uh, some old interviews you can find Leah's interview the written interview in there too when she was part of the Louise Michelle um, what else do we say oh yeah if you like what the Silver Fleet is up to and you want to help support us to continue to platform these amazing people then you can help us with a little bit of money uh, we don't have any adverts on here it's completely funded by me um, and if you want to help us to continue with this grassroots journalism then you can go to co-fee.com slash silver fleet and you can make a donation of the price of a coffee that's what the co stands for in Kofi. um and that will help go towards you know keeping the servers running keeping the website domain um my flights to italy and this kind of thing so that's ko-fi.com slash civil fleet and any donations that you make will be greatly appreciated if you can't do that times are hard i know um so what you can do instead is you could share the civil fleet around you can show it to your family members and your friends um share the podcast give us a rating on all their apps whatever app you're listening to this to um check us out on youtube give us a thumbs up and a follow on there uh yeah and i think that's pretty much everything i need to say this episode took a little bit longer than i hoped to put together but i think it's a good one i hope you'll enjoy it um, oh, if you'd like to get in touch with the Civil Fleet, you can email us at info at civilfleet.com. Uh, check out the show notes because the, all the contact details are there. And there's going to be a lot of notes for this episode, so go and check them out if you want to know more about the things we've discussed in this podcast. Right. I think that is everything I need to say. Hopefully, we'll have episode 55 out pretty soon. And um, I'll see you then. Cheers. Cheers.